Uh, let's get going, you guys. I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes, and I just want to hear, then we'll, we'll get into uh, our first stab at the, at the seafood surveys and see what's going on. Um, so just uh, uh, briefly, I wanted to hit a couple things that we haven't talked um, really much about, which is, so as, as uh, Professor Spees mentioned, um, we have some, there, there's, there's, there are emerging suites of tools to help us make an informed decision as, as empowered consumers. Um, so we can choose a, um, a good option or a less bad option, that kind of thing, as opposed to just doing stuff blindly. So all this stuff, a lot of stuff we've already seen, we've talked about this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're going to these different businesses and we're asking what seafood is being sold here, right? Either in a, in a package form or in a, on a plate. And well, the overarching question, remember, is if you're some random person walking off the street and you would like to exert your, use your economic power to support more sustainable options, um, uh, can you do that? If you walk into this market, if you walk into this restaurant, can you make an informed decision? How much of the, the stuff being sold gives you the level of information that you could therefore uh, use a guide or, or, or exert some of your knowledge um, to figure that out? And there's stuff we could talk about we'll skip over. Um, as we've already mentioned, the vast majority of our seafood that we consume here in the U.S. and especially here in California is imported. So most of the stuff is not managed by our local California um, uh, uh, seafood architecture. Um, the general approach is to um, do stuff similar to things like oil, oil and gas production, right? We are far from perfect, but we have standards, right? Whereas some other places in the world also have high standards, but some other places in the world don't have as high standards. So one of the first things you can do if you're, if you're trying to buy more sustainably is to, is to bring it into within, have the item or know that the item was harvested within a system that has you know, some kind of science behind it, some kind of rigorous enforcement. And so that would be something like uh, the USA for us, right? So that it's, it's coming from, from an American fishery. That means uh, you know, all of our food safety handling laws, anti-slavery laws, all that kind of stuff are at play. Um, and the farther we get away from that, the less confidence we have that those um, types of controls are, are being activated. Um, and as we mentioned, as, as, as Brenton was talking about before, we have various things like the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, Endangered Species Act, et cetera, that have gotten us to where we are currently with our seafood management framework. Um, the main entities that are managing our seafood in federal waters are NOAA, and then the agency within NOAA, and apologies if Brenton already went over this, but um, so, this, is, so this, this, is, this stands for this NMFS is an entity within NOAA, and it stands for National Marine Fisheries Service, as, as the name implies. That's for people that work on fisheries. We used to call this NIMFS. So we used to, the, people would, would verbalize this as if there was an I in here. So National Marine Fisheries Service is NIMFS. Everybody says NIMFS, 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 NIMFS. Then about eight years or so ago, they got on the tip that, actually before that, but more like a, a decade or so ago, 12 years ago, they said, oh, that's, that's not right. We're going to call it NOAA Fisheries. So they tried to rebrand themselves. So you might also hear the term NOAA Fisheries. That really didn't take. And we're back to, most people are back to saying nymphs. But nymphs and NOAA Fisheries are the same, uh, is the same uh, entity. And then within there, as, as Brenda might have mentioned, we have these regional fisheries management councils. So we have, there's seven, is there seven? Uh, I think there's seven regional fisheries. Yep. Yeah. So, so that is, you know, staffed by local people, knowledgeable of the local fish stocks, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's state uh, regulations as well, depending on where we are. Okay, another big tool that came on as we were doing this survey, or just around the time we were doing the survey, is this law called Country of Origin Labeling, or, or for an acronym we say the COOL laws. This is a U.S. law. And what this says is, hey, we need to know where this material is coming from. Now, originally the country of origin labeling laws had its root, uh, was based in issues related to unionization and, and um, American produced products, so cars and things like that. We want to see, you know, made in the USA kind of thing. And essentially that, that 
that effort kind of grows and metastasizes and changes and it, and it gets into food. And so cool is the attempt to apply sort of the made in America label to um, food production so that, again, you have confidence that this is, this is following the environmental standards, following the uh, human health uh, handling, all that kind of stuff standards. And so um, uh, basically what it says is that um, uh, uh, you have to say where the, where the country, the, the, who originated the seafood. And under cool laws, it's where the seafood is landed. Okay, So now we might be out in the middle of the Pacific fishing for tuna. So we might be near Hawaii or something like that, right? Way out there or maybe off the coast of California or something. But if we're a vessel who then first makes port or what we call lands in a port in Indonesia, that seafood would be labeled Indonesian. And, and so we also, you might also hear the term landings, referring to the seafood that comes off of that, uh, of that uh, boat, right? And so, um, so country of origin labeling originally applied to all of our, all of our meat, yeah, Carson. Is that where the, the first port that the seafood is removed from the vessel? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's where you. It's where you. Unlo- it's where you basically first record your catch. So yeah, if you got if you fueled up somewhere, it, that wouldn't trigger it. But the place where you would bring your seafood off, and usually it's weighed, so people would like figure out because you got to pay taxes and all. This, but so that so that that's the point we're talking about landings, okay. where you can think of a word where the seafood physically comes off the vessel. Uh, good question. Okay. So anyway, so so we had all these things. We had all these, all these, you know, chicken, beef, everything had to follow cool laws. But they have, but seafood, which might be surprising to you, has a very weak lobby compared to the chicken lobby, compared to the pork lobby, compared to the beef lobby. So this law was passed, and then immediately it was decided that that most of the other industries have a long time; they don't have to enact it right now. But seafood, because they didn't have a strong lobby, they had to go first. So first. Um, uh, cool laws applied to seafood before anything else in our food uh, safety system. Um, and then um, uh, they, it was updated in 2008 to say, oh, so for example, the classic one would be our squid. Um, well, somebody posted on one of my squid videos on YouTube the other day, like, we process squid in California. And I was like, really? Commercially? I was like, oh. That was news to me. Can you tell me where the processor is? <laughs> didn't get. They talked they talk about the, where it comes in for the lead. Uh, anywhere in California, I don't think we have any any large commercial scale processors for for squid. We have the one. What's the the one that's across from the CMI? That's where the that's the landings. For that's the landings, but they don't. I don't think they process them there. I think they just flash freeze them. Yeah, they flash freeze. So so again, I could be wrong. There could be something new that I'm not aware of, but. But we'll just talk about the situation as I understand it, and at least the situation was in the last few years. So again, maybe there's been some new plant open that neither of us have heard of, but I don't think so. But in any event, so we catch the squid. Squid is caught in California. And then we take it to, like Brent was saying, San Pedro or you know, Moss Landing or somewhere, and we offload it. That would be the landing location. But we've, we used to process all that seafood here. We've lost most of our commercial scale seafood processing facilities. And so then that, that squid is flash frozen. This is market squid. Flash frozen. It goes on sl- slow haul freighters over to China. They thaw it out. They, they gut it and then they steam it. You know, they, they, they cook it or whatever they're going to do to stabilize it. Or maybe put it into salads or whatever, you know, whatever prep they're going to do. Then they refreeze it, put it back on probably those same long haul freighters and they come back to the US. And so, um, so most of the work there is being done in China, but that is still labeled a US seafood product, right? Because, because it was first landed in the US. And so, so while cool is helpful, you know, it's better than having nothing, it can mask a lot of stuff. It can mask a lot of the carbon footprint. It can mask various things, but, but that's the tool that we have. Oh, I should also say, so, so cool, and Cool has some things. So if you're a little mom and pop, if, if you're selling fish off the back of your boat in Ventura Harbor, you don't have to label it. I mean, obviously, it's, you, know, you probably caught it right there. But, but still, um, 
country of origin labeling laws apply to um, large-scale seafood. So this would be anything in something like a supermarket, like an Avon's or an Albertson's, that would trigger it. Um, uh, or, uh, or the producer, if, they, if they're, if they're you know, doing a certain volume of material. So essentially, it's, it's not the mom and pop, it's, but everybody else essentially is held to these cool country of origin labeling standards. And that's helpful to us because that means that when we go look for something, we at least have some vague idea where it's coming from, right? As imperfect as it might be. Um, yeah, we'll skip over this. We don't, we don't have time for this. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, them, mm -hmm. them so you'll see in our market, in our market um, data sheet, the restaurant just says, where's it from? In the market data sheet, there's another column off to the right, which it might say processor location. So if you can get that, great, because that helps us understand that, but you can't always get that. So, um, so yeah, we can talk about that. Okay, so, so we have, so there's, there's, there's two broad categories for how we can, how we can figure out um, uh, if, if we should buy something or not, right? Or, or guides to better, better, more sustainable seafood. So there are certifications and there are buying guides. So let's first talk about the certifications. These are the most useful certifications that, that you might encounter or, or would be most uh, utilitarian for you here. Um, again, these are not things that you do. These are things that you would go to the store and look and see if they have this seal on them. Um, okay, so, so the biggest, the big data here is the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC. Um, they, they only deal with wild caught fish. They, they, if anything is, by, is farmed in any way, shape or form, that is ineligible for uh, MSC uh, certification. But because as we've talked about, we consume a lot of seafood in our world and a lot of people, like we, for, we've probably said this, but just to be clear, if suddenly tomorrow we didn't have seafood, that would suck, Brenton wouldn't be happy, he'd be all depressed, but we wouldn't die, right? We could eat some rice, we could eat some chicken or whatever the heck, right? But for the vast majority of people that use seafood as a major protein source, if they don't have seafood, they die. Right? So that's, those are the stakes we're talking about. For us, it's, while it's good and it's healthy and it's all that and it's part of our culture and everything, um, it's not 100% absolutely necessary for us to live. For many people around the planet, if we have destroyed fisheries, they will die. So let's just be clear about that. And so, so the demand with our growing global population, we need mariculture, aquaculture, right? So we've talked about ways that we hopefully are getting this better and improving things, but but there is no way just wild fisheries can support the demand for stuff. So they recognize this and so they created this, essentially the same version, but for aquaculture. Um, and then there's, a, there's another separate one, separate from them that's, that's best agri uh, uh, aquaculture practices. Okay, so um, uh, these, these two on the right are I, I would be surprised if you see any of these. Keep your eyes out for them, but, I would, but we don't we, we don't encounter them very often. MSC is also relatively rare, but it's, it's by far the, the biggest one. So let's talk about that. So, so this is a so-called third party. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a um, so-called third party uh, certification. What does that mean? That means it's not me, the producer, and it's also not me, the regulator, right? It's a third party. It's, it's, it's an independent arbiter, okay? So that's where, the third, that's where the third part of this comes in to be. Okay, where'd this start? This started with years ago with great ESRM style engagement with um, uh, 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 Gillette, the, the company that owns Gillette and these big Unilever, it's called Unilever. They own all these it's one of these mega corporations that owns all these different lines and home cleaning products and all kinds of stuff, including things like fish sticks, right? And so the WWF, the, the environmental NGO, was working on this and they're like, hey, let's get to a better place. And, and both sides were tired of people suing someone or doing some direct action where we said, you're murdering babies and you're slaughtering whatever. That wasn't 
getting us to where we want to be, right? And as we know, in our program, we're about let's find solutions, right? Sometimes we've got to swallow our pride. Sometimes we need to, you know, breathe. But the, the goal is to get us all better, not to thump our chest and say that we were right or something, right? And so in that context, WWF and Unilever got together and started talking. This is in the 90s. And they said, well, what's going on? And so they said, look, what we want is we want sustainably. And also, to be clear, everybody should understand this, sustainable seafood should be what most responsible businesses want. Because if you're going to blow out your shrimp stocks and you're only going to be able to supply shrimp for five years, that's a bad business plan, right? You want, you want to assure that you have this supply of this renewable resource that's coming in. And so that's the argument at, you know, that was made to Unilever that they totally got. And they said, yes, we would like there to be constant fish for our fish sticks going into the future. We don't want to have to constantly be switching to a different species because we've depleted population A and population B. So, so they got together. So they came up with this thing. So what they did was um, uh, we've created essentially accounting firms. So there are now a, accounting or auditing firms, environmental accounting, environmental auditing firms that specialize in this. So they're accredited. And so they're the ones that do this. So if you, so if Carson's a fisher, uh, is a fisherman or you know, owns a fishery or is operating a fishery or whatever, and he says, hey, I think my, I'm, do, I'm a responsible fisher. And Jordy, we know he's an a-hole, right? Like Jordy's a bad guy. So Jordy's fishing poorly. But right now when they both sell their fish, you can't tell the difference, right? So he's doing a bunch of stuff. He's making sure he's not, he's not damaging the bottom. He's making sure he's not taking juveniles, all the kind of stuff he's trying to be responsible. Jordy's like, yeah, juveniles, I don't care about the bottom. I'm a dynamite fish, right? All that kind of stuff. So, um, so Carson says, hey, I would like to be recognized for my good management practices, right? That I pay my workers a living wage, that I am not, you know, dam I'm not polluting, you know, all the different things we think are important. Okay, so... He reaches out to one of these marine stewardship, and originally it was, it was supported by grants and WWF and everything. Now it's essentially its own thing. Now, now it's, it's, you know, it was sort of housed within WWF. Now it, MSC is its own autonomous body. Okay, so he would call me up and I'd say, hey, and he'd go, yeah, I'd like you to, to, I'd like to get certified. I'd like to get MSC certified. And so I go, okay, there's a fee. So he has to pay me a fee the consultant. I get the fee no matter what happens. So he pays me. He doesn't pay me to, after he gets the answer he wants. He just pays me. And I'm, uh, I'm independent. And I said, okay, here's the deal. That sounds great. So I'll do a, a quick, I'll do a quick audit with him. I'll do maybe send some people out and we'll do a, you know, a thing, right? We'll, we'll, um, we'll, uh, uh, you know, do some initial stuff like, okay, wh where, where do you fish? How many boats do you have? You know, kind of the basics and stuff. And then, did you talk about uh, uh, data poor fisheries? No. Okay, so then, um, so then the, so that, so firstly, it's just what are you guys doing? Let me get the big picture of what you're doing. How many fish do you take this year? How many did you take last year? And the other question is, how is the fishery doing, right? So we do what, what's called a stock assessment. Yeah, so like, so do we have, is, is this, you know, a healthy population? Are they able to make enough babies to replenish themselves? All that kind of good stuff. Um, if there is enough data to do a stock assessment, then I do a stock assessment. If there's not enough data to understand if the fishery is over harvested, is being well managed, whatever, then I cannot complete his, he, he cannot go all the way through. He's, he's gonna give me a first payment, I'm gonna start the process, but only if we have this sort of larger scale information about the ecosystem and the, and the fishery, can we actually fully go through it. So we do a first little audit, and I would tell him this, I'd say, you know what dude, you're doing great stuff, but this is a data poor fishery. We can't, I'm not going to be able to do the thing. Or I'm going to say, okay, yeah, it's going to do it, but it's going to take a little while. So it typically takes about five years to get fully accredited. And it depends on the fishery, but it can cost, you know, easily hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, for you to get certified. And you're certified not forever, you're certified for a period. I think it's five years. Five years? I think it's five years. I think the first certification is five years. And then you, you need to pay to re-up it, but it's a much cheaper. Once you're in, it's more of just making sure there's, there's maintenance. Um, it's also about sending signals to Carson. So even if he does not get certified for, for something he's doing or the data is poor, I will also give him a breakdown. What are you doing right? Here's some things you could also, here's some of the weaknesses, right? you know, that kind of stuff. So, so for him to stay 
in MSC over time, assuming he gets certified, he has to over time show improvement in those metrics. So it's a way of constantly getting better, right? But you don't have to be perfect on every single, I forget how many, 34 different categories. There's a bunch of different things. So, so um, um, anyway, so, that, so that's that. So we go through this. This is part of a wider movement called third party certification that is, um, was very popular for a long time, still is kind of popular, but has run into some hurdles in the last few years. So you might also have, have you guys have heard of any other third party certifications? Like what? So the other biggest one other than MSC that's probably most popular is called FSC, Forest Stewardship Council, that certifies wood products from sustainably managed forests. Um, so places like Home Depot, Plet, this is you know, 15 years ago now, said, yeah, we're gonna get 10% you know, of our wood from M FSC certified um, you know, forests, and by, I forget what the date, because they never made it, by 2020 or whatever it was, we're gonna have like 90% of our wood products will come from a um, FSC uh, certified forest. Uh, go to Home Depot today and see how many FSC boards you can find. There, you will find some, but they're gonna be few and far between. So there, there are, there are, there's just a lot of issues with this. But, but the idea is, um, we do this, there are international certification agencies that certify the third partiness, so it's not some scam thing set up by some crypto bro or something who's trying to you know, pull the wool over your eyes. Um, but, th but that's basically how it works. So, so if that all works, if we've gone through the process, we've said, hey, we think we're doing a good job managing our fishery, come check me out, and then I, I go audit Carson, and all that kind of stuff, and he's, he's good, and we got the fishery. Then you get the seal. This is a trademark seal. So this logo is defended in court, right? So you can't artificially label, put this, this you know, I'm sustainable seal on your seafood. Um, if you see this, and you'll see it on our data sheet, you should also write down the additional information. So this is the logo, but then on every product, so a key aspect of this that I don't, probably Brenton didn't talk about, but a key fundamental thing about all this, all third-party stuff, is no BS, is transparency. This, the, the simplest one-word description of that is traceability. So I want to know that my fish came from Carson's stock and it didn't come from Jordy's stock, right? So there will be a number or a code on the box somewhere or on the can that says MSC, uh, MSC, then there'll be a bunch of numbers. You should write those numbers down. And those numbers you can take and go to a website. If you search MSC, go to a website and type that in and you will be able to know, ah, this is Orange Ruffy from whatever, the south coast of New Zealand and, you know, da da da, -da and, and that kind of stuff. If it's processed, it'll also say where it went to in the processing. So the idea is it's transparent. So I can see where that, it's not just, it doesn't just say generic fish. I can actually see the species, I can see the, the, the harvest location, I can see the harvest method, right? So that's MSC. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, the other broad category are green buying guides. The, the broad category would be green buying guides. And so the, uh, there's several, but by far the most, wow, it looks really pixelated. I should put a new picture in there. Um, the, uh, the main one, as Brenton mentioned, was Seafood Watch. Seafood Watch was a started by, as a program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, still is. And in fact, um, I should probably put up a, a lecture from one of our alums that now works for MSC. Um, he went and got his master's at UCSB and then was super interested in seafood from the stuff that we talked about in this class and then just kept getting more and more interested in it. Did a data mas database master's. There wasn't one that existed at UCSB, so he basically invented his own degree and then did it and then got hired with Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. And had, we, had PCH been connected, we would you know, have gone up and visited these guys' offices, but you know, um, that's okay. Oh, okay, so, so this started with, again, the idea of solid progress. Not perfect, not perfect, but how do we get to a better place? So this started with the so-called wallet cards. And so that's what you're seeing behind me, a tri-fold or a quad-fold panel that was designed to fold up to be the same size as your driver's license or a business card. So it would, and you, the idea is you put it in your wallet so you always, because if you're gonna go buy seafood, you probably have a wallet because you pay for something. The idea is always have it with you. So not something special, you have to bring in a binder with a clipboard or whatever, it's just always with you. 
And uh, the idea was green, yellow, red. Green, good choice. If you're gonna eat seafood, this is, this is, the, best, this is the best choice. These are um, sustainable or highly likely to be sustainably harvested. Yellow is not as good as green. If you can, pick green over the yellow. But if you're gonna eat seafood, the yellow is better than the red. And then the red is stuff that, hey, no matter what, you probably shouldn't eat these guys. Like, even if you're really, really hungry and it's the only thing on the menu for seafood, maybe skip seafood this, this dish, right? And so this whole project, our whole project started with a, with a discussion, one of our early coastal trips, when we were up in Monterey talking to those guys. And I said, hey, how come you only have this many fish on here, right? Which is a lot of fish but it's still, it's a small fraction of what's possibly available. And they said, oh, literally they Googled stuff. So they Googled menu in San Francisco, a seafood restaurant menu in San Francisco and a seafood menu in LA. And they looked and they saw, what are the most common things being sold? And I said, well, that sounds good, but what if we could help you with that? What if we could provide more higher resolution data for you as to what the most popular seafood items were? Like, yeah, it sounds great. We said, okay. So we did this whole project that first year and we're great. And the next year I sent it up to them and they're like, and the person had, had gotten, had left and moved to somewhere else. And the, the new person that job said, oh yeah, no, that's okay. We don't need that. They're like, what? We did all this work for you guys. I'm like, oh yeah, that's okay. And so then we just started doing it on our own. And, it, and so that, that was the origin of this. Um, now you can still get the seafood cards, which are great. But now, as Brenton mentioned, most of the consumption is migrated to the app. Because the app, we don't have that limitation. You could have all, you know, hundreds of fish on there. It's not just the few that fit on the card. Um, and now we have various regional specialties. So there's one for the East Coast, there's one for the West Coast, there's one for the Gulf Coast, etc. There's one for sushi restaurants. Um, and then, of course, they're produced in multiple different languages. So, um, so you can get it in Spanish, you can get it in Tagalog, you can get it in whatever, in, in many, many different languages. So it really has been a, a, a very useful, very powerful tool and Monterey, and, and the app is free, and the wallet cards were always free. So they would, uh, especially early on, send them all around the country to other aquaria and zoos, and they would put them up. And so it was, it was uh, you know, they took all the financial hit. And, and so they have a team at Monterey Bay Aquarium that just, that just works on this stuff. And so they're constantly looking at what, what are the new seafood things coming in, all this and that. And then they do these, essentially, like Brenton was mentioning, these stock assessments, or essentially these, these, sea, these fishery assessments. Um, and so they will have assessments on American lobster and on all these various things. And so for those assessments, they sort of run the show, but the people that do the vetting are mostly people like Brenton and I, independent scientists that they ask to, kind of like a peer-reviewed paper. Can you guys look at this? We think this is what's going on, but if you have more data, please add your data into this and then review it. And in some cases, they, can't, they cannot make a decision. It's just, it's too chaotic or it's, there's too little data. In other cases, and because we have the app now, we can be much more specific. So they can say, hey, you can eat, I don't know, you can eat um, red snapper from California, but not the Gulf of Mexico. So, so it's starting to get to the point where we have a higher spatial resolution, which is cool. In any event, all these green buying guides are not perfect, but they're just suggestions. And so the idea here is, in this case, there is no, there is no seal on the fish that you're, that you're buying or product, but it's rather what you as, an, as a consumer can be informed about your decision. Cool? So we have these, these actual certifications or accreditations, and then we have these uh, advice to the, to the people as you're at the point of sale. Cool? Okay. There were, yeah. We're at the NOAA Center, right? There was some. Yeah. Most of those are, are old ones that have just been boxed up and shipped around. So they're, they've decided to not print these anymore. Um, and they're just solely because they're finding that a lot of people don't really have wallets anymore and everything. You kids. And all that stuff. You kids these days. So they, they have it on the app. But the, another good thing about the app, too, is you can, if you go to a sushi restaurant and they have, you know, uni or who Magi or whatever it is, and they're not telling you what it is, they have that built into it too. So you can actually search the Japanese terms um, and it'll tell you what fish it is, which is, which is very helpful for some restaurants. Yeah. 
Um, one thing we just won't have time to get into this semester um, is, is names for things. So that, that would be like a whole class. Um, but there's many things where it's, it's, you know, it's a species, but then there's a common name that we might use, the, fish, the fishermen might use. Um, uh, and the worst is sort of Central America, um, uh, Spanish-speaking countries. Everybody has a totally different word for the same yeah, so it gets really confusing. It gets really confusing. So when you guys are writing stuff down, just write down what they say. We'll, we'll suss it out later. So, um, so uh, naming, as, as we mentioned with the sort of Patagonian toothfish and stuff, some of that is intentionally deceptive because the marketers wanted a better name, you know, for you to, to, um, to, to, to make it more uh, palatable to an American sensibility. But other stuff is just different cultural terms and, and just put it in just put it in Totally, totally. So don't stress about that. Just get the name down, and we can we'll work on data figuring later. Okay. So um, so great. So that, that that's the that's the brief introduction to uh, the last little bit that we haven't talked about in terms of the seafood surveys. So in a second, I want to hear how you guys are doing. But so again, th these are our, our sign up sheets for restaurants. So everybody should have signed up for one so far, and one market on the other tab. And so just a reminder, everything is because of. Because we're not entering into a, into a um, formal database as the first step, we're entering into these um, tabular spreadsheets. This is the way we have to do it. So just note, there is a restaurant flavor and a, and a market flavor of these things, right? So they're not all on the same list, A. B, for each of these things, so this is the data sheet where you guys will start typing in your data. There's also two flavors for each of the things. So there's the top of the data sheet, which is like collected once for that business, right? When you talk to the fishmonger, when you talk to whatever, when you look at the percent of appetizers, that kind of stuff, that's only one time. And so that is on the sheet that says qual, qualitative, right? So I have one restaurant I'm doing. It's going to be on one line here. So the 805 Copa Club, here's the da 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 all this kind of stuff, right? I'm going to fill it all out to the right, okay? Then when I start, and then, and then I, okay, so that, that's my first thing. Then the lower part of the data sheet where I went and actually looked at all the different, the fish tacos, the fish burritos, all that kind of stuff. So for that, I'm going to, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to copy this first little bit, which is going to be just like the name of the place, name of the business, your name, that kind of stuff. I'm going to paste that into here. And now on this one, for every seafood item, every seafood item, it's going to get its own row, right? So this, was, this dish was Cuban fish and chips. This was blackened espresso salmon. This one was paella. This one was, right, whatever the heck. So um, depending on, so everybody we'll have the same number of rows when we're done with this entered in on the qualitative one. Because you guys will all have done, in this case, four restaurants. So everybody will have four rows on this. But here, depending on our restaurants, there could be hundreds of rows, right? And, and yours might have five, and Jordy's might have 20. It's, it's, just, it's just gonna vary. Make sense? And then it's very similar uh, uh, for the markets. So the markets are very similar, except there's a few extra category. So I wanted to start with the markets, or excuse me, I want to start with restaurants because it's a little bit simpler. The additional thing in the markets are, um, uh, are there's a couple different categories uh, which we can talk about. But first before we get that, let me ask how, um, how your guys' market surveys went, your, your first trial, or excuse me, your first trial restaurant went. How did it go? Did, did anybody do them? Okay, right, okay. Two people did them. Okay, great. All right, so how'd it go? It was uh, fine because I did the Sharkies here in Camarillo. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, confused on some things, but I think 
uh, at least for Sharkies, it was pretty easy because the I was talking to the cashier. He was very upfront about everything, and they have a big sign when you enter next to the menu that says that all the seafoods uh, MSC MSC certified. Yeah. And how they always keep track with uh, seafood watch, and they just have that on a big blackboard. The only thing I wasn't sure about with the survey is like. So the Sharkies, they have like their burritos and tacos. And for each item, it's like, oh, you could choose your protein. So do I have to write each yeah. single item? Yeah. So if it was a burrito, that could be chicken or steak or whatever. You would enter it as a fish burrito. And then, and then, you, and then you would also enter it as a shrimp burrito, as a separate one. Because they'll have different price. The price it's probably a little, slightly different price, right? So you put the price down. So yeah, so every seafood item you do. And that includes like, you know, you know, they have fish burrito and they have fish taco. It's the same fish, but you would still end Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And in fact, you'll find that a lot of times. It'll say like fish this, fish this. And then when you ask him, it's cod, 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 cod. So, yeah. It's, you it, ask multiple, multiple, multiple times. About you'd, you'd enter it multiple times. Enter multiple times. Usually what you can do is if they just say fish, you say, hey, what's your fish? They'd say cod. That means, unless they call it out, that means like all of their stuff. Okay. Or they'll say, oh, our, you know. Our, our fish is cod, except for the daily catch, which is white sea bass or something like that, right? So, so yes, you do need to enter what it is for each thing, but generally speaking, you don't have to like, go to like ask 20 different items, right? It's like, hey, so the shrimp, I see you guys have shrimp, I see you guys have tiger prawns, like, are, like what are those? You know, do, do you know where those guys come from? You know, like that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not, it's not, you don't necessarily have to go item by item. If you're in like a super high-end restaurant, sometimes when everything is sort of clearly different, then yeah, but, but yeah, cool. And how'd it go? Good. Um, I didn't quite do it how you just said, because I did, um, cause all of like the main items were like burrito, like steak burrito and then substitute uh -huh. shrimp for it. But they had a separate shrimp burrito. Like they had, so I kind of read everything that was purely seafood and then put that in. And then I didn't mark like the things that you could just substitute in. Yeah, so you, so, so, you, so you just go back and redo that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how about when you guys ask the, where is it? How about when you guys ask the wait staff the questions? How'd that go? These questions. Mm -hmm. solid Great. Yeah. So, so that's ideal, right? Again, sometimes they're just going to say, I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they say, thank you. They're going to say, I don't know, or um, hardly ever, right? Or sometimes, right? And so, so then that's great to say, okay, so what does sometimes mean? Like once a week? Okay, cool. And you guys have about a hundred guests a week or something, or you guys have like a thousand. Yeah, so, so the more we can get, because we're trying to get percentage, right? We're trying to ultimately get down to percentage. So is it 10% of the people? Is it 1% of the people? Is it 50% of the people? Like what? So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and so again, uh, are you familiar with MSC Seafood Watch or other, other guides, right? Um, uh, yes or no. And then and this is you. This is you, the weight to staff person, right? This is, this is, are they, do they know about that? And the next one is how many customers ask about, you know, sustainable seafood, you know, none or whatever. And then this next one is how many, buddy, how many people ask about the, the source or the origin or their other seafood? Um, and the last one is just what, you know, um, what's the most common seafood related thing that people ask? This is all the different. This is all the different possible things on the menu. So, so again, we're trying to figure out: is this like a seafood specialty place, or is this a generic place that has a couple of fish burritos, you know, kind of thing? And so, gazuntite. So, um, uh, again, this, and it, this is just like when we did our opinion poll. Uh, obviously, this doesn't directly tell us anything about the seafood that 
that's being sold, like where it comes from, but this is, helps us with the explanatory, the context. Oh my gosh, is it that wealthier folks have this opinion? Is it that people from this zip code have this opinion? And in this case, it's gonna be like, hey, is, is a seafood specialty place more likely to know where the, how the stuff was harvested? Or is this a, is a, you know, this a rando restaurant that's, you know, whatever. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? So, um, so cool. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then the last one you guys should do is you guys should grab some flatware. You guys should grab some stuff from the restaurant, right? So a straw and a fork or a straw and a knife or something, right? Um, and, and, we'll bring, and, and make sure you just either label it with a Sharpie or... You can put it in a plastic bag and, and label the bag, but we want to sort of know where they come from. And so we're going to run out of time for this, but a future class will be able to look at this. We're trying to look at how plastic stuff is changing over the last couple of years. So we've been doing this for the last few years. And so you guys will collect that, even though we're, not, we're going to run out of time, we won't be able to analyze it. Um, okay, cool. So that's the plan. So now that you guys get the idea, uh, the last little thing I wanted to mention, and then I don't know if Brenton has anything else to chime in. So we're almost out of time here, but so, okay, so next is, what I'd like you guys to do now is now that you guys have gotten the idea, uh, go back in right now, go back in right now, and sign up for three more, so everybody should have a total, by the time we leave today, four more, uh, so a total of four restaurants, and a total of two markets. And as you guys are doing that, I'm just going to say something real quick about the markets. So the market surveys, um, there's, they're going to take a lot more time. They're going to take a lot more time than the restaurant ones, right? And, and they just will. So my strong suggestion, you don't have to do this. You can do it on your own. But my strong suggestion is you do a market with a buddy. And it goes a lot faster. Because the, the restaurant, you kind of look at a menu, kind of rise up down. It's pretty, pretty quick. But the market has got a lot of shit going on, right? A lot of stuff. And it just is logistically hard. So... So I'm, I'm trying to look at this canned tuna right here and it's, I got to physically pick this thing off the shelf and it's like, what is it? Is it, and it's just, it's just hard. It's a million times easier if Jason's with me and I'm like, bumblebee tuna, 16 ounce can, uh, albacore from blah, blah, blah. It just, it's way faster than twice as fast. So you don't have to do this, but my suggestion is get with a buddy right now before we leave and you go help him and his, and he'll go help you on yours. And it'll go way faster than you guys if you're doing them. In, and I get it sometimes just time, whatever you got to do it by yourself, but it'll go a lot faster if you partner up. Okay. Having said that, we have a couple extra categories. Okay, we, so, so on, the, on the restaurant, we asked about um, appetizers in main course, right? Here, we have, um, we have uh, uh, percent of the meat counter devoted to seafood, percent of the freezers devoted to seafood. If they don't have a meat counter, it would be zero. And again, you don't need to spend hours with this, but I can just look and if there's seven panels of freezer area and two of the panels are seafood, I just say two-sevenths. Just write down two-sevenths, right? You don't need to count. It's not about, it's just a rough approximation. If the seafood, if the frozen food section has, you know, I don't know, 20, 20, 20 freezer bays and two of them are seafood, I'd two, two 25ths kind of thing. Uh, how many total uh, restaurants do we need? Four restaurants, two markets. For the whole thing. So you guys are already signed up for one each. So just make sure you fill out the other two right now for the market. So that you should have two markets filled out and you should have four, uh, four uh, restaurants filled out. Okay. And then, um, uh, and like we said before, though, I, I prefer you guys to do those. But if none of those are near your house, you could add other ones in. As long as it's Santa Barbara or L.A. or... Um, uh, Ventura County. Have to be one of those three counties. Okay. Um, so then let me just add one last thing to point out to you guys. This. 
Um, for the restaurant, it's fish burrito and there's one column for dollars. The fish burrito is $25.95 or whatever the hell it is, right? For a lot of our products, for our canned tuna, there's gonna be a price. Sometimes your store will have a, a sale price. It'll say, or it'll, it'll say, it'll say um, uh, you know, value rewards club members, it's cheaper, right? Just put the raw price, right? Just, so don't, don't worry about the, the coupon for today or something. It's just what's the advertised default price, that's one. Two, what we really wanna know, what we really wanna know is the raw dollar per pound. The restaurants, it gets messy, right? Brenton just bought some tomatoes. Jason just bought some broccoli and we put it all together to make the fish. So all those prices go into the price signal of that dish, right? Everybody with me? And the same thing with when we, when we have a, a tuna salad, right? There's mayonnaise in there and there's pickles in there and there's all that kind of stuff, right? But the markets will also offer us raw stuff, raw. In some cases it's raw frozen, in some cases it's fresh. In the, in, the, in the fresh section. So in that case, it's not a dollar amount, it's a price per pound. So have a look. So we have two columns here. So we have the unit price. If all you know is that the can costs $8.95, put it in here. But what we really wanna know, the best is the price per pound. That's the clearest signal. And so uh, we can calculate this once we know it's a 16 ounce can of something, right? You don't have to do the math, but, but you wanna give us the math so we can do it. But this is, so you might, in, the, in the, some of the cases, you might just put it in a different column. Just, make, just be aware of that, the data sheet's like that. And like I said, here's fishery location. And then sometimes you can get brand and sometimes you get processor location. You can't always get these other two. So the first thing you need to do is you need to go to the fresh food section. That's the most important section of the market. Go and do all that stuff, okay? That'll be listed as fresh. And so you'll tick the box, this is fresh. The second one is go to the frozen section and do the frozen. Notice there's two versions here, processed and unprocessed. Processed is they've cooked it, right? It's a fish stick, it's a frozen fish stick. There's bread on it, it's cooked somehow. Unprocessed is it's just essentially raw frozen shrimp or raw frozen fish or whatever, okay? And then everything else is processed canned even if it's not in a can, if it's in a packaging, it's on the shelf, that still counts as canned in, the, in this, in this uh, system. And then we have all these different, these different descriptors, right? So it's either MSC, if it's MSC, you can put the number in here. It's either farm raised, wild caught, dolphin safe, something else. There's other possible things. You might say pole caught or something like that. Any other kind of additional, just, just put that in there and write it in. And that's it. So you're gonna first go to the frozen food section, most important thing. That's also where the fishmonger is. You can ask him or her the questions. Then you're gonna to go to the frozen food section, and then you're gonna to go to the other, which is mostly gonna be like the, like the tuna can aisle, right? And kind of do stuff. Everything has to be enumerated. Again, which is why it helps to have a buddy. It's also cool if you wanna go and do the fresh food and the frozen today and come back and do the other stuff so you're not there for you know, an hour or an hour and a half or something, right? You, you could break it up, but make sure you do all the fresh and the frozen stuff first. That's by far the, that's our clean, clearest signal, our cleanest signal is there. Cool? All right. So, um, so uh, keep cranking on this. This stuff will be due in two weeks, but, I, but like before, as you guys learned, I'm like, get it done now. Get it done tonight, get it done tomorrow, get it done this weekend and be done with it, right? I get it, there's a lot of stuff to do, but just be done with it. Do not let it go, because this is a hard one to make up. Also remember, uh, you do not, you have to physically go to the place. So even if they have a menu, a restaurant has a menu online, you can start with that, maybe pre-fill some stuff, but you must confirm that all those items are being sold and the price. So it's okay to do some prep, but that is not substitute for you going. You do have to go to all these institutions. Cool? And again, if anybody asks you, hey, I'm doing this for a class project. Um, every once in a while, we have had issues where folks um, have said, what are you doing? You're writing down, and it's, it's never been markets, but it's been um, restaurants, usually small mom and pop restaurants. When they see you guys walk in with a clipboard writing stuff down, they're like, are you a competitor? Who are you working for? And you're like, oh no, I'm in a class with, this is a class thing. And, and I, very rarely, but it has happened like, 
don't write anything down. If anybody says something like that, I'm sorry, didn't mean to offend, go ahead and just leave and you can do a different restaurant, right? So, so nobody gets in trouble. And also important to say, important to say, we're never, we'll never ever report somebody. This is not about, so we keep track of what businesses are what just because of, we're trying to understand what's, what's what, but we're not trying to make someone a victim. We're never gonna out somebody, but we're also not gonna t you know, write a news story saying you guys are the best seafood player, right? That's, that's not what this is about. This is about getting a, a community-wide perception of what's going on, a community-wide understanding. So um, it's important to say we're not trying to, we're not gonna get anybody in trouble. That's not, that's not the point of this. Um, cool, good? All right, fill those things out. And we'll see you guys on Tuesday of next week. Tuesday of next week. Because we have class Tuesday of next week. Because you guys will all be in class Tuesday of next week. So I'm looking forward to seeing you Tuesday of next week. All right, cool. All right, thanks, you guys. Unless Brent had anything else. Do you have anything else to say?